let's begin. Remember last time we left off talking about uh, cubic splines. We listed all of those conditions. You need to be familiar with all of those conditions. And one thing that cubic splines violate in our definition of interpolants is what? Specifically, when we started saying for an interpolation to a straight line, we said we needed two points, interpolation for quadratic, so square, second order polynomial, we need three points, cubic, we needed four points, right? But for cubic splines, we're putting a cubic interpolant between two points. How could we, how can, you, can we reconcile that? I was going to ask this question on the quiz today, but it's too long, so I decided to keep it as an exam question. Like, how can we reconcile the, those two? So when we looked at the straight line or the quadratic or the cubic, the traditional way of doing an interpolant, why did we need, as, why did we need those conditions? Why did we need that many points? And specifically, as many points as there are coefficients, correct? So for the straight line, you have two unknown coefficients. You need two points. For the quadratic, you have three unknown coefficients, so you need three points. So why, can you draw the analogy there? Can we, you draw the connection? So for three unknowns, we needed three equations. For five unknowns, we needed five equations. So we said the easiest thing is if you have five points, you pass the polynomial through each one of those points, those give, that gives you five conditions. Those five equations you need, or the four equations, or the two equations that you need. Okay, so we were relying entirely on the polynomial going through just eva being evaluated at as many points as needed. But with the cubic spline, we broke that assumption. We said, okay, I don't want to put a cubic between f uh, th four points. And we, re we realized also that as the polynomial gets high order, it starts oscillating, right? So I want to put a cubic in between two points. It's going to pass through those two points. So that gives you only two conditions. You still need two more conditions. How did we obtain those other two conditions? By looking at the derivatives, by putting conditions on the first derivative and the second derivative. Okay? So the only way to the, it's, so passing through, it, making the polynomial pass through a point is not the only condition that could be used to design and find the coefficients for a polynomial or for an interpolant. You could use its derivatives as well. Okay, so that way you could reduce the number of points you need to fit even a quintic, if you want. You could start matching second, third, and fourth derivatives, right? So instead of going for the function itself, for the polynomial itself passing through a point, you go through its derivatives, and so on. So that was the trick here that enabled us to do a cubic interpolant. Each has four unknowns, right? A1, B1, C1, D1, and so on for the other ones but only two points, right? So we match the derivatives. Now, cubic splines, I, I said, are your best bet when dealing with large data sets and you want a high order type interpolant to be used. Don't use an 18th order polynomial if you have 19 points of data, etc. Excuse me, just either use linear interpolation, interpolation to straight line, connect each pair of points with a straight line, or do cubic splines. Um, it's a, it's a great smooth interpolant, doesn't, get, doesn't have these oscillations like we saw with the high order polynomial because that, those polynomials need to go through, through the x-axis to, to hit the roots. Um, it unfortunately requires a little bit more work than standard interpolation. So if you go back to the conditions here, you have to match all of those conditions to derive a system of equations for all of these unknowns. And then you have to store the information that between point one and point two, I'm going to use F1. Between point two and point three, I'm going to use F2, and so on. So you need to tabulate all of that. It's a programmatic, um, it's programmatically heavy. Fortunately, Python does that for us, so we're not going to program it ourselves. It's quite a daunting um, um, thing to do. So we will re rely on the good people um, in Python who did that for us. Um, and just like, uh, just like F-solve, cubic splines don't come from NumPy, they come from SciPy. Okay, so that's the other library we've been dealing with. And the 
format looks like this. You import the scipy dot .im, you import cubic spline, the cubic spline module from scipy.interpolate. Okay, so you can do it this way or import scipy.interpolate as you know SCI and then SCI.cubic spline, whatever you, however you want to do it. Um, I like to do it this way because then I have access to that routine called cubic spline. And the, fun the format looks like this cubic spline. I'm calling it on xi and yi. And I'm storing, so it's, it occurs in two steps, just like we did polynomial interpolation. You do polyfit and polyval. Over here, you need to do cubic spline, which is going to fit those splines to find the coefficients. And then the next step is to evaluate take those coefficients and evaluate them whatever you want between the data. So the first step, you call cubic spline on your input data, xi and yi. So we're following that same terminology that we used. xi are the input independent variables. You choose which one is independent, which one is dependent. You, sw you can swap the meaning as you please, but be clear about that. In the first argument, it's the independent data, and in the second argument is the dependent data. And you store that in a variable. I like to call it CS, you call it whatever. But essentially, CS is a, is a Python thing that stores all the information about your splines. It stores all the coefficients that we saw earlier, A1, B1, C1, D1, etc. It knows that F1 works between the first two points. F2 is between the second, two, the second set of points and so on. It stores all of that information for you. It has like a table lookup inside it. and and then when you apply it, you just simply apply it as CS at the point you're interested in or the array of points that you're interested in. So XE is the value where you want to interpolate, and it returns um, the dependent variable value at that interpolated value, okay? Um, so, you know, kind of straightforward and simple using Python. So we will do this now um, with the density and temperature data. So we're going to do a little bit better than the linear interpolant in terms of accuracy, and much better than the 18th order interpolant that we did last time, okay? But again, you have two steps, polyfit and then polyval, okay? So just like polyfit and polyval, you have two steps, cubic spline and then applying the cubic spline. Okay, so let's get our Python notebooks open, please. So we start with importing cubic spline from scipy.interpolate, and we're going to call cubic spline on the input data. What were our input data? If you forgot, go back to the top. It, were, it was t and rho. We stored everything initially in t and rho. So t is our independent variable in this case, and rho is our dependent variable. So what do we need here to put in the first question mark? Go ahead and try. So I'll put T, this is telling me here xi is in the first argument. I need to put the independent variable entries and inputs, and then the dependent variable inputs, row. And then once you execute this, gives you an error because I didn't define this. So there you go. OK, so now if you print, if you're in doubt, you print it out correctly. OK, so print CS. What, what is CS? It contains a bunch of stuff in it. It's a cubic spline object. It's a thing in Python that contains all the information about splines. It doesn't only contain the coefficients, it contains tables of the coefficients, the function evaluation, a bunch of other things. You know, don't worry about that. All right? Okay, so delete this. Now to evaluate the density at t equal 4, 412 and 415, you simply um, call this uh, CS at 412 comma 415. So you can give it an array or single value, and then you get two values for the density. Okay, 0 0.84 and 0 0.85, 0 0.84. You can check that those values are reasonable by going back to your plot over here. So we had 412 and um, 412. So just around here. So 412. Right, it's less than one, it looks consistent, and you can plot it on top of the original data. We did that with the other interpreters. I'm gonna do it with the, with the spline again, okay? And, okay, so now the elephant in the room was, if you remember in, in this high order polynomial, when we did, did it at 980, 
it gave us a negative temperature, a negative density, minus 0 0.4, right? Because it dropped below the physical range over here. Okay, so let's try this with the cubic spline. CS at 980, you run it, ah, it gives me a reasonable value, 0.355, and that should lie between those two data points. We will see that in a second. Okay, that's at least not negative. Okay, so good news. And then finally, I want to plot the da new data between the in original data, between 100 and 1,000. I want to put a lot of points so that I can see how the splines look like. So I'm going to put 200 points between 100 and 1,000. And I'm going to interpolate the initial, the input data, which we created the interpolant for. And I'm going to interpolate them at all of those new points, 200 new points. Right? And then I'm going to plot them on top of the original data. Okay? So the original data is here, T, row, and in circles. And the splines, I'm plotting them as a line. Because I have a lot of points. It's going to look like almost like it's continuous, which it is, kind of. And look how beautiful this is. Okay? So let's expand this guy a little bit. Right? Nice, smooth, no straight lines. If you compare it with the, with the linear interpolation we did here, which was this, you had like these straight lines okay, in between. Okay, so over here, it's smooth. These are cubics. So between each pair of points, there's a cubic. Okay? Not a straight line, not a quadratic, it's a cubic. Okay? It was fit between those two points, and it matches the first and second derivatives between the spline before it and after it. So at this point, the deriv both first derivative and second derivatives are equal. Same here, same here, same here. Right? Splines are great, highly recommended, use them a lot. Okay? So that's it with um, 1D interpolation. I want to talk a little bit about 2D interpolation and then start prepping the stage for regression. Hopefully we have time and I got a thing with me for regression. Okay, I'm going to measure how well we're going to do in regression. Okay. Okay, now 2D linear interpolation, I'm only going to give you an overview of how it operates, and you need to understand that. The math is not incredibly difficult, it's doable. I used to give it as a bonus problem on exams. Um, sometimes, some years I do, some years I don't. Um, but if you want to work it out, you know, by hand at home and like, you know, chat with me about it, I'd be happy to help. Um, but I will explain how the process works. Now, when we say two-dimensional interpolation, um, and it could be n-dimensional interpolation. You may say, Professor Saad, we only have three-dimensional space and time, right? So that's like four dimensions. We're not doing string theory or anything like that. No, no, no. I, I don't mean by dimensions. I don't mean physical or time dimensions. I mean state dimensions. So for example, you could have a state variable or a quantity that depends on temperature, pressure, density, um, velocity, three velocities, for example. So each one of those independent variables can be thought of as a dimension in its own. So when we, th when we say we're doing interpolation, 2D interpolation, it means you have two independent variables and a response variable or a value that depends on those two. Here's an example, specific volume. So that's like the opposite of density, the inverse of density, instead of kilograms per cubic meter. So how many cubic meters does a kilogram occupy? Not how many... Uh, 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 kilograms a cubic meter occupies, okay? So the inverse of the density. So a specific volume of water depends on both temperature and pressure on both of those things. So if you were to tabulate this data, it would look at different temperatures and different pressures. You have different specific volumes and it varies widely. So this is a surface essentially. If you plot on the X and Y axis, if you plot temperature, pressure, and your surface, your response is the specific volume, it's going to be a surface. But it's two-dimensional interpolation because it depends on two independent variables. 
And you could have three-dimensional interpolation, five-dimensional, 17 dimensions. It's not unheard of. We have chemical mechanisms that depend on potentially 20 dimensions. Okay, so we tabulate all of that, and you need to be able to do interpolations on those. So here's potentially an example. What is the specific volume at 175C and 0.75 bar pressure? So th it's the point that lies over here. Now we have data around it. Okay? Instead of having only two data points, now you have four okay? because you are in two dimensions. Okay? So the idea is, okay, how, how can we figure this out? How can we interpolate this? So I, if I have those those um, four data points, so let's take this diagram, okay? Let's take this diagram or keep it here, okay? So I have, I have a point here, point there, point here, point here. How could we interpolate this? If it's sitting, yes, Gretchen. So, so uh, what do you mean? Like draw a line like this or a line like that? Where, where they intersect, so do straight lines like that. Would that do you think that's going to work? Why not draw the lines over here or like horizontally and find an average in between? Okay, can we use 1D interpolation to do this? Can we use multiple 1D interpolations to do this? Okay, tell me how. Pressure. Yeah, it's like the pressure. So tell me which numbers, for example. Um, it's like um, one and 1.15, 1.51. Oh. Oh, oh, no, no. Yeah, so I'm here. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, 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 oh, but, but those are the values, right? I'm interpolating those values to these points. So these are the values that are being interpolated. So, okay, 1D. Yeah. Okay, so do 1D interpolation here. Yeah, and then you'll do um, interpolation for um, the, I guess you the bottom. Or, yeah, the bottom. And then okay. You the and then you do the two points. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could go other way around. Yeah. Yeah. So your colleague is precisely right. What he's suggesting is we can build on what we learned from one dimensional interpolation to build a 2D interpolant, but do many 1D interpolations at a time. And the idea is, OK, we interpolate these two points to this guy here. And then we interpolate these bottom ones to this guy. And then we interpolate the result to the middle. And that's exactly how 2D linear interpolation works. So I'll show you. If you have these, this set up like this, and you want to find the value over here, okay, you first do 1D interpolation. You could do it in this, in this direction. So you take these two values and just do a 1D interpolation there. So that's your straight line that you would draw. So we're going to draw them along the, the rectangle, and then we're going to get to the middle. Okay? So th then you would draw a straight line as if you're drawing a line between those two values. Okay? So if you put those two values on an x, y axis, you can draw a line there and find the interpola interpolated value in yellow. And then you interpolate those other two points, also 1D interpolants. 1D interpolant, okay? You apply that formula, and then finally, you interpolate the yellow points to the middle. You can do it the other way around. You could do what Zach suggested. Do it in X first, those two, those two guys, and then this way. The math is tedious, okay? It, it's doable, uh, but it takes a little bit of effort to do it, and you get quite the formula for this. You get this really nasty formula for this, okay? But it's doable. Now, if this red point was right in the middle, it would be just the average. If it, were, if it were right in the center of that rectangle, the geometric center, it would just be the average of all four points. Agreed? It's like equally weighted and affected by all those four points. But because it's not, these coefficients are giving you the weights. If the red point was right in the geometric center, these coefficients are going to be 1 over 4, 1 over 4, 1 over 4, and 1 over 4. Exactly. But because it's not right in the geometric center, it's, you're going to have to weigh the effect differently. Because obviously, phi in red is going to be more affected by phi 1, 2 than it is by phi 1, 1, right? So you have to weigh that effect a little bit more. 
So you get a, a, an appropriate value. Thankfully, Python can do that for us as well. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I'm not going to do this exercise with you in class, but I have the code um, on the slides. You can just copy and paste it and work through it. It's not that complicated. Um, but the idea is that there is an interpolant that does 2D linear interpolation in Python that's built in, and it comes from NumPy, okay, uh, sorry, from SciPy again. Um, I'm thinking about interp um, in 1D in NumPy. It's like NumPy only gave us interp and polyfit. But SciPy gives us this interp 2D, okay, which does 2D interpolants. And it also proceeds in the, in the same manner as we did with polyfit, polyval, cubic spline, and then apply, evaluating it. Same thing here. You first create the interpolant by calling interp 2D, but now you have to give it x and y values, which are your independent variables, okay, your temperature and pressure, and then the, the, uh, the actual values, zi, and then you specify a method. Okay? You can actually go beyond linear. You could do cubic and quintic. That's quite complicated. Um, but you will use this in, in heat transfer, potentially, when you take heat and mass transfer um, next year. And you could use this, and I'll give an example of heat transfer in a second. Okay, so what, what this looks like, xi is the inter independent variable entry, same for yi. Doesn't matter how you want to organize them, temp temperature pressure or pressure temperature, as long as they're the independent variable. And the zi is the dependent variable. Okay, that's your response. So in the example we gave, it was the specific volume. So you call interp 2D on x, i, y, i, z, i, and you bring in, put in the method where you do linear or cubic. Um, and then you store that as a, in an object. I call it F2D or interpolant 2D. Um, and then you apply it on which points you want. So in this case, you have a pair of points, right? X and Y, X, E and Y, E. So temperature and pressure, those two values you want to look at. Okay, and then you get the interpolated value by doing it this way. So here's an example. You can download this example from, um, uh, from Canvas, 2D interpolation example. It's an example, okay, no questions mark in it, marks in it. And what I'm doing here, I got some experimental data uh, from a heated plate in the lab. So they had some thermocouples. They measured the data at equally spaced intervals. They were a little bit kind of, you know, uh, rugged, right? And it's a you know four meter, five meter plate, and we you could take these data points and you can make a clean, nice, smooth representation of all of those data. Okay, and this is what the interpolated value results from this. So what I did here is the same thing we were doing with the one D case. I put, I was given one, two, three, four, five points in each direction for the temperature. Okay, so locations and temperature. And I created so many points in between. So let's see. I created in the lint space, I created 100 points in the x direction and 100 points in the y direction and interpolated these data to all of those points. So I, get, I got a cleaner representation of the data. Okay. Now, are we creating new data here that... Um, let me phrase it this way. We are generating new data, but is this new data considered new information that didn't exist in the system? Who thinks it's, this is like new information or this is just more, more fine-tuned information that already existed? Is this new information or not? Okay, who thinks it's new information? So I have a couple here who think it's not new information. Finn? No, oh, it's, n it's new information. Okay. New information. Okay. Who else? I want to separate you into camps. <laughs> so why, why do you think it's not new information? Let's start there. Aaron. Okay. You, the data you measured is just what you measured. There's no more. You're not creating new measurements with this, yeah, right? Okay. What do you think? Yeah, that's a similar thing. Like, I guess you can think that the values are like, like in between. Yeah. Like, the values that we still are existent. 
Okay. Okay. It's not really new information. Okay. Why do you think it's new information? Mm. But okay, so maybe I need to clarify what new information is something that is like a discovery. Like would, would, so this is what we measured here. Would going from this to this potentially show a dis new discovery and the data that you didn't measure? No. Yeah, so it's not new. You're not generating new information here. You're not gaining more accuracy, you're not gaining more information about the system. You're only representing it with a little bit more smoothness, okay? Because only the measurement is going to be connected to the truth. And only the measurement is going to give you new information. You want a new information between these two points? Put a measurement there and measure it. By simply interpolating, even if you use a cubic, even if you use quadratic, even if you use linear, it's just generating information between the data you measured and you're making a best guess that it's going to look quadratic or it's going to look linear. But what if it's not? The only way to know is to actually measure it. So be careful with interpolation. You are not generating new information. You're making an estimate, a best guess of what's in between but it's hardly new information. I mean, we call it new data, and in the definition I said we're generating new data, but not new information. Okay, so we're just generating new numbers, but not new information. Information carries more weight to it. Information has meaning and insight, etc. Okay? For all I care, there could be a black hole here. So it's not gonna detect the black hole, okay? So be careful about that. With interpolation, you're like, oh, this is better data. It's not better data. It's this is the data. This is the most accuracy you're going to get. You're just representing it in a little bit cleaner way. Okay? You're having more points in between. That's it. The fact that it looks smoother is not indication that it's better. Okay? I just set up this problem this way so it looks like that. In fact, this data was generated from this. So we went from this to there, and then we interpolated back, okay? So be careful, we're not generating new information, okay? All right, so now we're starting to hit um, the edges of the black hole. We're trying, trying to escape from the black hole, and uh, this is gonna pull us back into the black hole, and uh, we're gonna be stuck in there, uh, at least until after regression. Uh, arbitrary basis functions, that's the title of the next few, few slides. And I added these slides last year uh, because I think it's a great opportunity to talk about this subject as we start thinking and get ready for regression and generalizing what we call regression analysis. Okay? So now recall that an interpolating function by definition must pass through each and every point of the input data. It must pass. Whether, whether you're using all of those points to satisfy the coefficients or some of them, even for the cubic spline, we ev although we only passed it through two points, it must pass through all the input data. In your quiz, what did you think that interpolating function was? Was it an interpolant or not? Okay, why not? Because it didn't pass through each and every point. In fact, that curve that you saw is regression. It's not interpolation, all right? And we we're gonna do that curve later. Okay, so, so far we used polynomials to represent the variation between data points, okay? But what if you have a little more knowledge or information about your, how your data varies? What if it varies sinusoidally or like, you know, there's signs and logarithms and exponentials? Why? I don't know. You know, you're going to know better. One, some of you are going to be, you know, building plants for making chewing gum or for making toothpaste, right? And the process over there looks, could be, you know, in a, follow a certain format, or you're doing fermentation and bacteria uh, growth and decay goes exponent. So you know something about the data. And it's, and once you have information, you can do better than just a blind guess to use a polynomial. Why do we use a polynomial? So this is a side note, and for those who kind of like math, 
Why do we use polynomials? Because real in reality, the xy space is full of polynomials. There's more polynomials than anything else in the function world. In fact, every function can be approximated by a polynomial Taylor series, right? So polynomials, we say that the real space is dense with polynomials. So that's why we're like, our best guess, we're going to put a polynomial between data. Because polynomials are, there's always a polynomial going through somewhere, OK? But sometimes you know more information. If you know more information, you can actually reduce the disorder in the system. So when we also are setting the stage for statistics, where we're going to talk about information theory. And so once you have information, you can reduce the entropy of the system or the disorder in the system because you know how, how the system looks like. So what if you say, you know, my data, I have a couple of points, and I know the variation between them could be a cosine and a logarithm, not x squared or, you know, ax plus b. So now the question is, are we limited to polynomials for interpolation? Could we do something else? Let's see. I'm going to propose that I have a, date, a couple of data points, x1, y1, x2, y2, independent, dependent. And I know more about that system to put a straight line. I want to put this one, a cosine x plus b log x, as an interpolant between those two points. Go ahead, find me the system of equations that governs a and b. And recall the definition that an interpolant must pass through each and every point. OK? We are after the coefficients. We assume that the data is varies as cosine x and log x, a combination of, of those two. Okay? We need to find the coefficients. What are the equations that govern the coefficients? Don't look at the answer in the slides. Try to do it yourself and rejoice in the victory. <laughs> if you looked at the answer, at least try to do it. This doesn't make sense. So you have two points, put those two points. On a graph, draw the x, y axis, put a, x1, uh, y1, x2, y2, and draw a curve between them. It's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be a cosine and a log, right? And pass that polynomial through those two points to get the conditions for a and b. Well, what did we say? We said the polynomial must pass through each and every point. That's how we get the equations for the coefficients. If you still don't know how to do this, you're going to be in trouble. You have to know how to do this. Okay, so we said that by definition, an interpolating function must pass through each and every point. I have two unknowns here, A and B, but I have two points. If I pass this, poly this model on those two points, each point is going to give me one condition. So one, equ one equation, two equations, two unknowns, that's it. So I pass it through Y1. I get at y1, it should be a cosine x1 plus b log x1. That's the condition. We want to find a and b, so this is true. And same thing at x2. The model at x2 needs to be equal to y2. That's the condition we're forcing on this system. And then you get two equations with two unknowns. And you put this in, you know, matrix form. You get a linear system of equations. Again, it's linear. Is it linear? Yes, it's linear. Although the model is 
has cosines and logarithms in it. It's a nonlinear model, but it's linear in the coefficients, and that's what we're trying to find. Because the cosine and log in this system, they just numbers. This could be 2.1, 3.7, 5.6, minus 0 0.8, whatever. It's just numbers in the matrix. Okay? Okay. So in general, one can perform interpolation with what we call arbitrary bi basis functions. What is a basis function? One wave, not very rigorous definition, but that works for this course, is that a basis function is simply an elementary mathematical function, the simplest mathematical function you can think of. x, x squared, cosine x, log x, exponential of x. Not cosine x plus log x, that's not an elementary function. That's a combination of elementary functions, okay? So basis functions are simply elementary mathematical functions that you can combine them together to build a complex mathematical model. So here, I took cosine and log, each is an elementary function, and I combined them linearly to build a complex model, right? I'm allowed to do that, okay? And we can do interpolation with any combination of basis functions, okay? So, the way this looks like, when you have something like this, you call these the parameters or the coefficients, and you call these guys as your basis functions. Okay, so now do this. What are the basis functions for these models? I'll give you the first answer. For A plus BX, the basis functions are one, because it's A times one, plus and X, which is the second basis function. Okay, list the basis functions for all of the other ones. And all of these could be models that you use for interpolation and later for regression. And by model, again, I, you, think, you think the data behaves this way. How do you know that? Because you're gonna be expert in your field. You're gonna know that the data behaves, there's exponential decay with bacterial growth or propagation. There's you know, exponential decay with diffusion processes. Okay? There's Gaussian, you know, there's all sorts of things that you will know when you become an expert in your field. So all of these are models for, could be interpolation and regression later. Now identify the basis functions here. Okay, so let's start with the second one. Uh, one X in, uh, and X. Okay, good. Um, what about the other one? On someone from the back. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, what about this one? Okay, and what about the last one? Cosine and log. Okay, easy. Right. Now, the example we did resulted in a system of linear equations. Okay, because the coefficients showed up linearly. So keep that in mind. Now, in general, in general, you can come up with an arbitrarily arbitrarily complex model for your data by combining an arbitrary number of elementary functions. You'd have sines, cosines, logs, square roots, x squared, whatever, in general. So if you call those basis functions phi, so phi1 would be one basis function, phi2 another basis function, all the way to the mth basis, you could have seven basis functions, okay, or ten, or two basis functions, okay? Each one has a coefficient multiplying it. Now, if the, whether this is a good idea or not, that's not the point. It's actually not a good idea, but I'm, I'm using this to set the stage for regression. Okay, in general, we rarely have, th the problem with this model is that you have to pass it through each and every point. So you need m points for this because you have m unknown coefficients. Okay, otherwise you would have to start matching derivatives, etc. Okay, now to interpolate this model, one needs m data points as if you're doing just the standard interpolation. 
And then the system of equations becomes, you apply the model at x1, and that's equal to y1. You apply the model at x2, so you're passing the, your model through each and every data point. You apply it at point x2, so you get a1 phi1 at x2, a2 phi2 at x2, etc. That's why I keep telling you, don't go to the matrix before you write this, because you're gonna, I'm going to confuse you in the exam. I'm going to confuse you in the quiz. I'm going to confuse you in the homework. You have to start here and then write the, write the system of equations in matrix form. Don't jump to the matrix form, okay? Please. So that you see what's going on. You see what's an unknown, what you know this is. You have a lot of indices now. Phi1 at x2 and phi2 at x2 and phi2 at x1, etc. It can get very complicated, okay? But write them down systematically. Y1 at x1, y, y model at x1 is y1, y model at x2 is y2, and so on. So you write them all, you're passing, essentially what you're doing here, you're forcing your model to pass through each and every point. You're going to find the coefficients such that all of this is true. If you can't find the coefficients, it means you cannot pass it, and you'll get a non-invertible matrix, okay? But if you can solve it, then you can pass the polynomial or the complex function um, arbitrarily. So then when you write this in matrix form, um, something really cool happens in the... In the columns, you have your basis functions, first basis function, second basis function, and so on. And in the rows, you have the first data point, the second data point, and the third data point, and the nth data point, right? So you see phi1 here, phi2 here, et cetera, phi m. And in the rows, you see xm, or x2 in the row, or x1. What I want you to take out of this is just the ability to think further than what we've done. Because if you can do it for a quadratic, you can do it for an arbitrary number of points. It's just a simple extension. OK, great. This is going to head us back when we do regression. OK, so keep that in mind. Now, what if I want to do this model? Why? My model is alpha hyperbolic tan beta x. Given two data points, x1 and x2, now use this model to interpolate between those data points. Find me the system of equations that governs alpha and beta. And what do you think about that system of equations? So again, pass the model through point x1, y1, and point x2, y2. Got it? Okay. Okay. So what do you think about that system? Can we, do we know, what, what is it? What kind of system it is? Is it linear, bilinear, nonlinear? What is it? Nonlinear? Nonlinear? Okay. Do we know how to solve it? F solve, right? System of nonlinear equations. We did that, right? Yes. So this is called nonlinear interpolation. Uh, so now you understand why. Okay, before I, I tell you why. Okay. So we have two unknowns. We need two points. Okay. So y y y model at x one is y one, and y model at x two is y two, and then you get this system. And by now you should recognize that this is a nonlinear system of equations in alpha and beta, because beta is showing up under the hyperbolic tangent. Okay, under a transcendental function. So to solve this, you need a nonlinear solver. You can turn it into a residual form, put it in F solve, and find alpha and beta, and you're good to go. Okay. But now you understand why. So this is nonlinear interpolation. So now you understand why I make the <coughs> distinction between linear interpolation and interpolation to straight line, because to me, everything we, we did before is linear interpolation from the perspective of the system of equations for the coefficients. In other words, the coefficients of the model show up linearly. In nonlinear interpolation, the coefficients show, non show up nonlinearly, okay, within complex functions, okay? All right. So, in general, it is possible to combine basis functions in a manner that results in nonlinear system of equations for the coefficients. 
And by definition, a model in turbulent will result in a linear system of equations for the coefficients of the basis functions if those coefficients show up linearly in the model formula. So when I give you a interpolant model, you have a cosine x plus b x squared, b and a, they show up linearly, right? So that is gonna result in a linear system of equations. When I give you a model alpha cosine beta x, that's going to result in a nonlinear system of equations for alpha and beta. Okay, so help me with this now. I have these models for interpolation. Which one is going to result in a linear system of equations for the coefficients or a nonlinear system of equations in the coefficients? I'm not asking if the model itself is a nonlinear model or not. All of them are nonlinear except the first one, it's a straight line. But what I'm asking specifically is for A and B, do they show up linearly or nonlinearly? Go. Yes. 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 Whatever you were saying. <laughs> that was said with a lot of excitement. <laughs> Okay, first one, AX plus B. Do A and B show up linearly? Yes, okay. So that means when we do interpolation with two data points there, it's going to result in a linear system of equations for A and B, okay? I'm not asking if the model itself is linear or nonlinear. What about the second one, AX plus B over X? Linear, why? I got too, too many answers from you guys here. I want the back to participate. Or the middle, actually. It's like the... <coughs> so why is it linear or nonlinear for A and B? Nicholas? Yep, exactly. Because in other words, you can also say if you can separate the basis functions out of this, which are x and 1 over x, right? So you have a times x plus b times 1 over x. Their a and b are not acted upon by any kind of weird function, so it is going to result in a linear system of equations. Okay, what about sine ax plus b? As is, no trigonometric magic or whatever. Sine ax plus b. Linear or nonlinear system of equations? Linear? Nonlinear. Agreed. Why? Because A is under the sine function. You cannot separate it out from X, and so it just makes everything nonlinear. Okay. What about the one after? X to the power A plus B. Again, no funny business, no transformations, no taking logs of it, just as is. Nonlinear. Nonlinear. Okay, because A is acted upon by this expo exponent function. Okay, like an exponential. Okay, what about this one? E to the alpha times x plus beta x squared. Linear, non-nonlinear, it's only one of two options. So for all I care, e to the alpha is a, <laughs> right? It's just a number. So e to the alpha, call it a. So e to the alpha by itself is going to show up as a coefficient everywhere. e is just a number to the alpha. So call all of that a. You can invert it later with a logarithm. Okay? So this 
will result in a linear system of equations if you treat it right, correctly. And you want to because they're easier to solve. Okay, what about this guy? Beta e to the alpha x. Can you separate e to the alpha from x? It's e to the alpha to the power x, right? And even if you call e to the alpha a, it's still a to the power x. It's acted upon by a transcendental function. So it is nonlinear. Okay. Okay, again, not the model linear or nonlinear. So don't tell me later, no, I thought I was as answering the question if the model is linear or not. That's not the question here. The question is, does this result, if you're doing interpolation for two points, uh, does it result in a linear or nonlinear system of equations for the coefficients? Okay. All right. We're done with this. Um, I have 20 minutes left. I think I can cover the intro with 15 minutes, 17 minutes. Take three minutes, stretch your legs, drink some water. Okay. And we will start with regression. <laughs>